Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patty Barron, and I am the Director of Family Readiness Programs for the Association of the United States Army. And it's really just exciting to see so many wonderful faces um, here in the room with us today. And for those of you watching us online, we're really excited that you've tuned in. Uh, before I introduce our moderator, I want to go over just a few administrative details, if I may. We have placed a mic in the center aisle. Um, the last speaker will be Sergeant Major of the Army, Dan Daly. As soon as Sergeant Major finishes his remarks, you can start lining up. For those of you that are watching us online, uh, there is a box at the bottom of your screen. That's the comments box. That's where you can go ahead and place your questions. We will um, grab them and hopefully shoot them up to this screen right up here so that um, our moderator can ask the questions. And so now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Lieutenant General Guy Swan, AUSA's VP of Education. General Swan, thank you for agreeing to be our moderator today. Okay, Patty, thank you. I always feel like I'm preaching to uh, a church group up, on, up here. But uh, hey, let me uh, welcome all of you once again to the Association of the United States Army. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, wherever you may be around the Army. Uh, we're very pleased and proud to be able to host this event today. I'd also like to extend a, a warm welcome to uh, the many other uh, veteran service organizations and military service organizations that are represented here, as well as the many spouses, family members, and friends of the U.S. Army who are joining us today. Like the Army itself, uh, AUSA takes military family readiness very seriously. After all, the operational effectiveness of America's Army is in many ways tied to directly to the health, well-being, and indeed the readiness of Army families. This forum is a great opportunity to bring your voice to the Army's senior leadership and for them, in turn, to provide their perspectives and solutions to you. We've got a lot of ground to cover today, so we're going to get right to it. Uh, joining us are three of the Army's top leaders. Uh, in the center, you see uh, the 23rd Secretary of the Army, the Dr. Mark Esper, on the far left the 36th Army Vice Chief of Staff, General James McConville, and on the right, the 15th Sergeant Major of the Army, Sergeant Major of the Army, Dan Daly. Gentlemen, welcome to all of you. Each of these leaders is going to provide uh, an update on some key policies and programs affecting Army family readiness. And then, as Patty mentioned, we'll open the floor for questions uh, we'll try to get as many in as we possibly can, uh, both from those of you here in the room and those out in streaming land. So with those ground rules in place, let me turn the floor over to Secretary Esper. Sir. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. Okay, let me push out. <laughs> sure. Okay, you got me now? There we go. Okay, we'll try that again. Rewind. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. And uh, thank you, Guy Swan. Thank you, AUSA, for hosting this important uh, Family Readiness Initiatives Forum. I'd like to begin at the beginning, and that is when I was sworn into office uh, nearly 15 months ago, the first message I sent to the field emphasized, of course, the three Army priorities of, uh, of uh, readiness, modernization, and reform. But then I was very clear to make, uh, to make evident that we have an enduring priority, and that is taking care of our soldiers, our families, and our civilians. And so over the course of the, my first year in office, I had a chance to go around the Army with my wife, Leah, who's here as well. And really, everywhere we traveled together, we would meet with family readiness groups. We would meet with spouses. We would meet with young soldiers with their spouses. Um, she would travel to the uh, uh, child development centers, the hospitals. I would do my share as well. And over the course of our travels, whether it was uh, Asia or the Middle East, uh, across the United States, Alaska, Hawaii, you name it, uh, common themes kept surfacing. And, uh, and so in the last several months, we've been able to turn those into actions, ideas, uh, into directives to really help improve the welfare of our soldiers and their families. And you'll see on that sheet that you should have received coming in a number of things that have already been implemented or are underway. And I, I want to talk about some of them today. Of course, in October, we had the uh, AUSA conference, and we also did a family readiness forum there. And a lot of good issues came out. 
And uh, we took action on many of these issues, but we also wanted to make sure we had a forum by which we can come back to you. And uh, this today represents that opportunity to come back to you and talk to you about what we did. Now, that said, this is also an opportunity for you to tell us more. Uh, give us more ideas, more things you're, you're seeing happening out there in the field. Uh, finally, throughout my travels, nearly everywhere I go, I do a town hall. And it would involve soldiers, uh, family members, spouses, DA civilians. And from those travels, we get a lot of good ideas, a lot of issues get surfaced, and we're able to address them one off without really being able to tell the broader story or the changes or the issues that have arisen along the way. And so one of the other things that we're gonna, we've done here, and I'll show it later here this morning, this afternoon, is to set up a web page uh, whereby you can see issues I collect on the road, uh, what our answers were, and how we're dealing with them. And that way we can, we can raise the awareness of the broader Army community, our broader, broader Army family that is out there, to tell you what we're doing, what we're taking action on, or things that maybe that will take longer to implement because it involves Congress, whatever the case may be. So that said, before I turn it over to uh, uh, for comments by the Vice and the Sergeant Major. I do want to run through, you th through a few things to give you a sense of where we are on a, a number of issues. And I'll just I'll move through it pretty quickly because I, I do want to save time for our, our, our family members, our spouses, the, uh, or, or the associations being represented by any of them to, uh, to ask some questions or make some comments. Uh, first of all, on child care, this may be one of the biggest issues that uh, Leah and I have heard on the road, the challenge of finding adequate daycare in facilities, and particularly in overseas or OCONUS facilities where it's been a particular challenge. So we are, um, we are revising our policy to allow, make sure soldiers receive the priority that they should in our child-based development centers. And uh, we are making other uh, changes as well. We've uh, made changes to what I call the second biggest topic, which is spousal hiring, uh, civilian hiring, to make sure that we can put people much more quickly into the daycare centers to provide the staffing. If you were to look at our statistics, you find in many reasons, the, the reason why, in many cases, the reason why our child development centers are not at full capacity is we have an insufficient number of providers. And uh, that gets into the second issue, spousal employment, which is directly related. These two are interrelated issues. Now, last year when I came in, it took us an average 134 days to hire a, a, a civilian. And uh, you can see the challenge. Nobody is going to wait 134 days. Or by the time you do, another opportunity has come before you or it's time to PCS again. So my goal has been to get us below 60 days. Um, we're, we, we are moving fast, uh, not fast enough. We've decreased the number by 10 percent. Uh, but every day we're pushing hard uh, with both uh, internal to the Army and with OSD. And I've had numerous conversations on Capitol Hill. In fact, uh, just this morning, I was told by OSD PNR uh, that we will be soon receiving new authority for direct hiring authority, which allows us to hire folks in certain specialties in a matter of weeks. And soon we will see a new policy come out on uh, what's called PPP, which is preferential hiring. And that will give us another tool to make sure we can hire folks uh, much more quickly. We're improving automated, uh, uh, automation. We're looking at doing conditional hiring um, for child development centers. We're doing something, we've done something called on-site hiring. We're moving, for example, to standardized position descriptions, which allows for civilian hiring to occur a lot more quickly. Uh, we've eliminated duplicative boards. We find that weeks of time are chewed up at the installation level where hiring managers are taking, I would say, too much time to hire somebody. So reducing duplicative boards, coming up with standard positions, really gives us a, a lot more authority. So those are just some examples with regard to spousal hiring, civilian hiring, and how it relates to child care, where we're really trying to accelerate the process. Closely related to that, of course, is spouse credentialing. Um, you know, previously there was no policy to assist Army spouses who require a new state license. Uh, and as we know, spouses, and I've, I've talked to them everywhere from Fort Campbell to Fort Bragg uh, and overseas, pay significant fees to transfer license. You could be an accountant, um, a, a doctor, an attorney. And so we are developing a new policy to reimburse the expenses for transferring license for most spouses. And at the same time, I'm going to continue to work on Capitol Hill to, uh, to get lawmakers to come up with a broader national policy to make sure we could do that. As many of you know, we've built into our own approaches that as we look for new installations, moving people, that factors will include spouse or hire, hiring, credentialing, and stuff like that. Um, some more family readiness initiatives. Uh, this is one that I've heard from, the Chief of Staff has heard from as well, and that's home-based businesses. So in the past, it's been very difficult to start a home-based business. And, uh, for many spouses, it's um, a means of additional income. It's a livelihood. It's, 
it's, it's important to them. So we've recently clarified through directive that HBBs do not compete with AFES or MWR and should be considered a supplement to both. Uh, commanders have been instructed to develop a clear, easy to follow HBB application process that should take no more than 60 days, if not half that time. And so we've, uh, we'll be sending out more directives to the Army, but again, we wanna make sure that spouses have the ability to set up home businesses in their homes and, uh, and, and, and help provide for their family if that's the reason why they're doing it. Another important topic, parental leave. Uh, previous policy provided limited amount of leave time for mothers and primary caregivers. Only married soldiers could take leave. So our new policy just assigned a few weeks ago provides mothers the flexibility to choose between six or 12 weeks of non-chargeable convalescent leave. And we've also increased parental leave available to spouses and secondary caregivers to three weeks. And there's more detail, of course, to this we can get into because we have our experts up here as we need to. But again, another big change for the Army that I think will help our families. Uh, exceptional family member program. I've heard a lot about this, particularly OCONUS, uh, about challenges. And uh, by the summer of 2019, we hope that soldiers and families with assignments to OCONUS locations will benefit from a DOD standardized family member travel screening form. Additionally, families will be allowed to be screened at any military treatment facility, and EFMP families will receive a guide to help keep track of all these forms. At the same token, my push has been internal to the Army to give uh, families, parents, uh, a lot more say in the process on both ends of it. Uh, I, I think you need more voice. I've heard that consistently, so we're working to make sure that we build those into the system. Family readiness groups. Um, again, uh, the common theme, too many restrictions on family readiness groups. What are the expectations? Uh, some limitations on the ability to raise funds in, in terms of FRGs, really wanting what, want to do what they do to support our soldiers and their families. So our new policy that will be coming out eases restriction on restrictions on using informal funds so that they can be used on a wider variety of support and recognition. Uh, funding can be raised anywhere on post, as long as it's uh, with the uh, concurrence of a of an installation commander. It does not compete, again, with AFES or MWR. And we've also done a lot to limit the reporting and the other bureaucratic stuff that really has been a burden to families. So more to follow on that, but that's uh, kind of what you'll be seeing coming out here soon. Military housing. We certainly are committed to providing uh, safe housing for our families. Uh, we're currently in the process of, a, process of inspecting approximately 40,000 pre-1978 homes to ensure families are living in a safe environment. Um, out of an abundance of comp, uh, caution, we've done visual inspections of 10% of the 13,000 pre-1978 homes. And for the ones that were involved with lead paint, I actually spent some time at Fort Benning a few months ago. I was at ground zero to observe what was happening and all the reme remediation taking place. But we also look for other things, lead and drinking water, asbestos, et cetera. At the same time, in my budget, we're reallocating uh, a, a pretty good sum of money to make sure we eliminate all Q3 and Q4 housing that's the lowest level of housing by the year 2025. And we're increasing funding in the near, near term to get us on a trajectory. I think 2025, right, General Bingham, or is it 26? 26, okay, thank you for correcting me. Household goods, another important issue. Um, my wife, Lee, and I, during our numerous PCS moves in the military, experienced our share of lost, delayed, et cetera, items. Um, many of you have had ne negative experience, particularly after last year, where we, we really had a, a hump over the summer season. This obviously came up the, the uh, form at AUSA last October. Uh, this year, the uh, household goods carry list with customer satisfaction scores will be posted online. And I want to thank Transcom. Where are you? Transcom says, thank you for doing that. I think uh, there should be behind me an example of what that will look like. Uh, the aim is to give families, those who are moving, a lot more transparency with regard to the scores of s the ratings, the scores of uh, companies that may be moving your household goods. We're also looking to add more companies to make sure they have that within the Army. We're going to try and smooth out that summer hump, particularly in the peak of the peak period. And there's some other things we can talk about if we, when we get to that in this discussion. Um, but that's just some of the initiatives we, we've tried to move forward with in the, in the last few months. Uh, some other things I'll just hit briefly, total Army sponsorship program. Uh, we want to get to the point very soon where no first-term soldier uh, no junior enlisted soldiers are moving or leaving their current installation without having a sponsor at their future one down to the unit in which, uh, in, in which they are arriving. Uh, with regard to community service and reform, we're trying to empower, aiming to empower commanders, local commanders, a lot more authority to tailor the resources of their garrison to the needs of their community. So that means adjusting MWR, adjusting um, ACS, whatever the case may be, to meet the needs of their family. 
Uh, lastly, and I'm going to turn it over to the chief because I've, I've taken up too much time here, is I, I said earlier I go on the road a lot, do a lot of town halls, and we get a lot of good ideas, and we're able to uh, answer questions or dispel myths, whatever the case may be. And so the other thing we're standing up on the Army website, I think it should be up behind me, is a, a, a new web page where as we go along the road, uh, you'll be able to see commonly asked questions, FAQs, and what the responses are. So it's a way for the broader, again, the broader Army family to see what our answers are, but particularly those wherever I travel, to see the specific answer that we've taken back. So I know I've covered a lot of ground. We'll have a chance to talk in more detail as we go on. But I want to pause right there and say, again, thank you, AUSA, for hosting this. Thank all of you for attending. And I'll turn over to the vice. Well, thank you, thank you Mr. Secretary. Yeah, and I also I want to echo the Secretary's uh, thanks to AUSA for putting this together. What a wonderful event. And, and a special thanks to all of you who came out today to support our families. That, that really means a lot to us. And, and it's very, very special. The Secretary did a great job of laying out the, the policy changes that are undergoing the Army. I've been in the Army for a little over 37 years right now and married uh, for, for 31 years. And my wife and I have three kids that serve and one's married, so we have a little different perspective on families uh, in, in the Army today. And today, 53% of our soldiers are married. And 43% have children. So it's a family business. And what we see is kind of changing. Most, many of our married couples are dual military or they're dual working professionals. And we need to recognize that because that's most of the young people coming in. That's how they're coming in. And if we want them to stay and serve, we have to take care of them uh, in that manner. Because you know, we, we enlist soldiers, but we retain families. And we have to make these type changes. And that's what these changes are all about. And that's why we're going to put them in place, and we want your feedback, and we want your help so we can make sure that families not only, you know, survive their enlist, but they actually thrive during that, because we do have a great Army, and families are a critical part of that. And what I'd like to do right now is turn it over to our great Sergeant Major of the Army, Sergeant Major Daly. Sergeant Major. That's you. Mr. Secretary, General McConville, um, and ladies and gentlemen, First and foremost, echo the comments of what General McConville just said, and thanks for being here. Um, we can't do this alone. We don't do it alone. I'll mention another group that's here with us today, too, but I always said that the people that show up for these kind of things are the ones that are vested, and they got something to say, and it's, it's, our, it's our job to listen. Um, by all means, you've heard me say it in the past, and I'm, I'm going to say it again today. Uh, we're not perfect at doing this, but we're the best in the world, and I believe that, and we will continue to strive uh, to do that. And I think that's evident and the amount of energy that the Secretary of the Army has brought to family programs. If you remember, when he came on board, he said he was committed to this. He went to AUSA and took issues. What you uh, took your issues and concerns, what you don't see is the passion, enthusiasm, and energy behind the scenes that we get to see in this great group in the front here, which is the primary staff, and his persistence. You can't walk down the hallway without being questioned about, Sergeant Major, what have you done about this? And, uh, and that's positive energy that our headquarters needs. And, and, he, and he puts word to deed, and then he puts deed to paper. And things happen, and that's evident of uh, what we've gone over today. So I'm proud to sit up here with this team, uh, General McConville and the Secretary, because they are vested from both uh, a personal um, and a professional, but, but truly invested in the families, because they've all lived it, and they're continuing to live it every single day. So uh, thanks, Mr. Secretary and, and General McConville. I'd like the Secretary, um, and due to him and the Chief giving me the bill to do so, I get to travel around the Army pretty liberally. Um, sometimes I'm a little scared of how much authority they've actually given me to travel around the Army, but I take full full uh, use of it, trust me, as Secretary. Um, but the benefit of that is with the same sec thing Secretary said was I get to talk to soldiers and families, and sometimes I get to have what I call the fireside chat. So we just grab a soldier and grab an MRE, and for some reason they feel like they can just uh, tell me anything that's on their mind, which is good. And, and that's important, and it's important for us to do that is because we've got to be the barometer and to be the, the gauge for the, for the force. And we're not always perfect. But what I'd ask you is that we can, need, need to continue that feedback. But I'd also ask you is the chain of command, I promise you, is the best mechanism to get after it first. Sometimes it's difficult for us to fix things when there's a lot of pressure externally. In most cases, the chain of command could have fixed it right there on the spot on the installation. So I'd ask you is that as uh, these issues and concerns is reinforced to your families and your communities that we empower our chain of command by first giving them the first opportunity to fix the problem. 
Now, nobody at this table is going to shy away from any of these problems, I promise you, and the Secretary is not going to let that happen. Um, but in most cases, that's how we get it resolved, down at the chain of command level. And that chain of command also needs the benefit of being able to understand those things so they can provide services for their families and their soldiers um, commensurate to their needs based upon their geographic location, as the Secretary said. You know, we recruit soldiers, but we retain families. And if there's any indication of how we're doing, um, we recruited soldiers at a higher rate than we at last year than we have throughout the history of the Army. And that's something to be said. But by all means, that doesn't mean we don't need to be reminded of the things we need to fix. So I appreciate your energy and your attention to, uh, to the issues and concerns that we have across the Army. I look forward to uh, assisting the Secretary and the Vice Chief Staff of the Army in answering your questions and getting after your issues and concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Stay down a little lower here. Um, before we start with questions, we're going to need you to come up to the mic here and uh, introduce yourself and identify yourself uh, or your organization. We'd really like to get uh, questions from family members and members of organizations that uh, have an interest in Army families as our priority questioners today. Uh, and then I was just told by uh, Greg in the back that we've got 238 stations online uh, right now that are uh, tuned in to uh, this discussion. Uh, before we get to uh, the first question, um, let me ask a show of hands, who's got a service member in your family right now that's serving? How many? Quite a few. How many have had someone that has served out there? Okay, even more. Well, thank you very much for that. And uh, well, let me go ahead and start with uh, a question from uh, TV Land from Erica, who is a Department of the Army civilian spouse. Uh, and I'll give it to uh, Secretary Esper, and you can defer, Mr. Secretary. I understand that the ability to sign up for the AFA, that's the uh, uh, Army Fee Assistance. Army, Army, Army. Right as a DA civilian will cease on 28 February 2019. Does our child need to be born prior to 28 uh, February 2019 to be grandfathered in, or is it possible to sign up while being pregnant? Well, thank you. That's a good question. Let me uh, start off by saying it's the, the date is March 1st. It's children born by that date, of course, and, and, and signed in. So. The reason why we're doing this is, is uh, the Army is a singular institution. The Navy, to some degree, is, uh, puts out large sums of money for this, and it's money that, that we have chosen to put into other programs, some of which is housing, some of which is other on-base programs. So uh, we tried to choose a date that was months in advance. We, this policy was signed in November, and it's just a matter of picking a date, and, uh, you know, that's the date we went with, March 1st. Okay. Anything you want to add? Shy group here. Ah, yes, ma'am. Please identify yourself. And my name is Megan Harless, and I'm a military uh, army veteran and spouse. And my question is that it's my understanding through an RFI published in November that a single move management system is expected to roll out for peak season 2021, effectively privatizing the PCS season. What is the expected cost benefit to moving to this system, and has there been a study done to support spending taxpayer money on such a large scale change? Uh, thanks, Megan. I think you asked the question last year, right? I did in October. Yes, All I did, right. sir. All right. Good, good job. So, Transcom, do you want or somebody? Because it's more detailed than we're tracking. I think this is in. Go ahead, General Sullivan. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so, if I could, uh, Transcom has been a terrific partner as we've worked uh, specifically on the short term issues as we approach the next peak season, but also long term structural issues. And the contract change that you mentioned is one of those initiatives that Transcom is working right now. They're still uh, working through the, uh, the details. Uh, the, the timeline you provided is correct. Their goal is if this makes sense to do and it does improve effectiveness, it improves customer service, um, and they will uh, let the contract in 20 and then implement in 21. But that is all condition-based as they go through the discovery process and work through the specifics. But there is a group right now, Transcom, and Colonel Ralph Lonsborough from Transcom is with us, uh, is part of that, is working toward that end. I hope that answered your question. So a follow-on to that, sir, is that if that program doesn't take effect till 2021 for that peak season, what effectively is putting being put in place to help families for the next two years 
why we wait for that program to roll out? So there's some specific things we're doing. So first and foremost, uh, we are establishing uh, increased quality assurance inspections at the point of pack and the point of delivery. Right now we're doing about 25% of those in person. The goal right now is up that to 50%. Additionally, we're creating now more CONUS moves. So most of the damage and loss that occurs, occurs when things are put into storage that are not created. So Transcom has put out that notice to industry to increase the percentage of that for the CONUS moves. That's done right now for all O-CONUS moves. The last thing I'd mention, there's a host of things. We'll be happy to provide the details to you on, on the others, but in May, Transcom will stand up a 24-7 hotline so that anyone throughout the DOD who's having issues with their move can call that hotline and get visibility on where their shipment is, uh, remediation for any issues. Some of the frustration, as you well know, is that because the household goods move is, movement process is so segmented, you have to call multiple parties while your shipment is en route to get visibility to solve problems. That will no longer be the case come May. And that is targeted specifically to help the situation over the peak season this coming summer. And again, there's a host of other things we're, uh, we're doing in concert with Transcom. Transcom has been a terrific partner, and we're happy to share the details with you. Mr. Secretary. Sir, Major, you want to add? I would just uh, just reinforce two points. One is uh, we are doubling down on the number of quality assurance inspectors, right? so be on the lookout and tell your family members to be on the lookout for them. And that doesn't mean just because they're one of the 50%, because we are doubling up the 50%. If they want a quality assurance inspector, we'll call. We'll get one out to the families. We will. And uh, the second point is, is, and I mentioned this during the AUSA town hall, we need your help in, um, in giving feedback on the transportation provider. Um, some of the metrics that they have are very good. The feedback says that they're doing a good job. Now, that falls in the peak seasons, but it's important that you give feedback and uh, on who that provider is as well so we can take action. Thank you. Let me uh, take one question here from uh, the outlying station. Uh, Shawnee Mack, a uh, military spouse from Fort Rucker, uh, and her question is, I'm a, a veteran, a former GS employee, a military spouse, enrolled in the spousal preference program at Fort Rucker. I have two bachelor's degrees, one of which is in education, the other in psychology. I was a teacher, but due to a PCS, I'm now on unemployment and have been looking for a job since last May. Not only is it extremely difficult to get a job on Fort Rucker, but the town we live in is very small and also very difficult to get a good career job. What is the Army doing to, uh, to this system, systemic problem in terms of policies or programs to help alleviate this stress on military families? Uh, well, I appreciate the question from uh, from Shawnee uh, with regard to this. <clears throat> you know, I, it, it sounds like uh, somebody that's very extremely qualified, and it's it's fair to say because on my travels, uh, you know, I, I hear this. I meet wonderful spouses. They they tend to be uh, overqualified and underemployed, and, and and Shawnee seems to be almost an extreme example of this. Uh, obviously, I can't correct the market in a small town in Alabama. Um, I mean, it's just the nature of things. But what we can do is continue to provide program support uh, for, for, for spouses in those particular areas. Uh, we must, we have to do a better job uh, on spousal hiring and civilian hiring for those jobs located on bases that we provide. There's no reason why uh, somebody should have to wait 100 plus days to get a job. Um, there's a bigger issue out there as well. In fact, the, the vice uh, chief and I had a meeting earlier that touched on this, and that is PCS moves. Uh, I've said... Uh, several, on several occasions, I want to slow the turmoil, reduce PCS moves. Uh, we have some things underway to do that. So, uh, for example, we're moving to standardize um, all CONUS tours and most OCONUS tours to 36 months. So if you were OCONUS previously rotating every 24, uh, now we're going to get it all synced up. Uh, also, within the personnel system, we're trying to get the message out that it's okay to stay in one place for an extended period of time. In fact, I recently met with an officer who had been in one location for all 18 years of her career to date. And, um, and so that's fine, I think, as long as you're performing your role and it's uh, value added to the Army. So I think to the degree we can stabilize the force, uh, particularly if a spouse has a great job, uh, doubly good if the kids are in good schools and the parents are happy, is we want as much as possible to reduce PCS turmoil. And again, we were talking about that a couple hours ago as we were discussing the, you know, a, a new market-based talent management personnel system and how we could um, uh, do the same with, with more broadly across the Army to help 
persons like Shawnee out there who sounds like left a good job, a good career, uh, and, and to go to Fort Rucker. I don't know if you want to add anything, Vice. No, as, as, as someone that's been to Fort Rucker uh, many times uh, as an aviator um, <laughs> and haven't taken my wife there, first of all, it's a wonderful place with wonderful people. But the point the secretary made, it, it's very difficult for spouses that have professional degrees. They'll come into a school system or if you're a registered dietitian, you're ner it just, you know, that's one of the things we've been talking about because uh, at the highest levels, people are taking a look at this. People are very interested in taking care of our spouses. Uh, many of you have professional uh, certifications that every time you go, and I have someone that lives very close to me that has a professional certification, every time she goes to a new state, she has to sign up yeah. again and spend the money, try to get a new job, go back to the beginning where you, know, you move up and then you move. You move back down, you move up. So the secretary said, you know, there's, there's a couple ways to get after it. One is, it's just educating uh, senior leaders throughout the country on the importance of what our spouses do. And then second of all, is, is just changing the model of how we move people. And we are taking a hard look at that right now. One size does not fit all. You know, we, we have a model where you move just because it's industrial age, every two or three years you have to move. Not necessarily. You know, when we move to a talent management system, we, we're actually with, we're putting this P at the end, a preference thing, which is kind of blasphemous in the Army, where you, you have a preference on where you're going to go and maybe stay if that fits. And then as long as you're in a position where you're contributing and, you know, you want to stay there, we'll let you stay. And I think that can ground families in a better, better place so they can become part of the community and they get the jobs they need. And so we don't have that solved yet, but we are committed to making that happen. If I could add maybe Sergeant Major, uh You've done a lot of work on credentialing of soldiers. That's a major effort underway. Does that extend into the spouse community? Well, I know that this past year the NDA did pass and gave us uh, the authorities, and uh, I think the Secretary did mention it. we're working on a policy um, to help uh, spouses of service members uh, recoup the costs associated with licensing credentialing. What I can tell you, though, is that uh, some of the benefits that we'll gain that it will extend to our family members on our installation is our CSP programs and our corporate fellowships, um, which are open uh, to our family members as well. Um, we have those throughout the installations. A lot of those are your trade industries. They are, but there are also some academic and some corporate fellowship opportunities for spouses. So what I would say is uh, you got to look out the means of traditional job shirts. There's a lot of people out there that want to help. I mean, um, industry. Right. Um, uh, partners that we've worked with and uh, and don't discount the great people at our transition assistance centers uh, I've talked to each one of them I visited everyone at each one of our major installations and their primary means uh, of resources is available for our soldiers but all of them said they would never turn a family member away um, and they have uh, tons of resources and job opportunities because they're talking to the industry and community um, and we are partnered with the Department of Labor so I'd ask you is uh, use every resource you can I know we can't solve every job problem um, but as the vice and the uh, secretary said, people at every echelon to the highest levels are working this. Great. Yes, ma'am. Go right ahead. Hi. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Erin Wagnon. I'm with the Military Officers Association of America, and I'm also an Army spouse. Um, I just had one point of clarification that I wanted to ask and then a, an actual question. Um, so you mentioned eliminating Q3 and Q4 housing, uh, which is awesome. Is that just for government owned, army owned housing or is that also within the privatized housing mm -hmm. initiative? Sure. General yeah. Bingham, you want to talk about it? I'll, I'll, I'll let my expert get into in depth detail. Great. Thank you so much for the question. And I will tell you, we're excited because our senior leaders have put emphasis in all places where our soldiers <laughs> and families reside. And that being barracks and our army family housing and put emphasis also on our privatized housing. When we are talking about Q3 and Q4, which is poor and failing infrastructure, we have poured lots of dollars into uh, those money pots to alleviate Q3 and Q4, as the Secretary said up front uh, by FY26. Uh, he's also stated that there would be no family living in Q4, which is failing housing, by the year 21. Originally, he put teeth to that. We were on a glide path for failing to be uh, bought out in 24. That was not good enough, and we're grateful for it. He uh, added more money to the pot, so to speak, and we're now able to see no families 
uh, in Q4, our worst housing by FY21. So we're really excited about that. Thanks, General Bingham. I, you know, it, it is important. As we've done a lot of reforms in the Army in the past 12, 13, 14 months, we've obviously put rearranged a lot of money into modernization of the force and into the training. But we, we are putting dollars into other parts as well. And housing has been a big one for me. Um, you know, Lee and I, on a few moves, tried to get into on-base housing. In some places, we didn't want to get into on-base housing because we knew the quality. So my commitment was to get was to get rid of Q4 housing ASAP, and I think you just said about a year and a half or so away from that, and then eventually get all Army housing to Q1, Q2. So that Q3, Q4 rating is just for Army government-owned housing, not for privatized housing, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hey, just, and, I'd, I'd just but, like to make a point, if I could, on government housing. It goes over to transportation. If you're not satisfied with what you're getting, make sure you you fill out the surveys. Don't give them, you know, top marks. Those surveys come back. At our, at our level, we, we, we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of things going on, millions of people. But those things matter. So we are paying these. Th there's contractors being paid to give you the things you need. So if they move you and they don't transport your stuff and they break it all, you let us know and we'll hold them accountable. If you're in housing and privatized, they're being paid. They're not doing it for free. They're being paid to provide quality housing for our soldiers. And if they're not doing that, we need to know. And we need to fill out those surveys, and you let us know. And if you don't get it, just send me an email, okay? Great. Thank you. And so my, my <laughs> final question. I'm just going to foot stomp what the, what the vice said. It's just like household goods, same for housing. Uh, every month we review the, the customer satisfaction rates of housing. By the way, we do it with hospitals, too. And, and I could tell you, for each of our, our RCI contractors, I know exactly where they are in satisfaction rates. Some are high, close to our mark, and some are low, and some are heading in the wrong direction. But that's what we pay attention to. So please, if you've had a bad experience, let us know. Re record that. That's how we track it. That's how, that drives where I go visit as well. I go to certain bases just to look at certain things, as do, do the, both the gentlemen on my right and left. And so it is very important to, to get that input. All right, and last thing, and I'll get out of your hair. Okay, you sure? Uh, <laughs> maybe. Okay. <laughs> so I read an article this morning talking about the um, focus on, wep on modernization of the Army and of weapon systems, and that there was the Army Secretary, yourself, uh, signal willing willingness to cut programs to make room in the budget right. for modernization. And so I was just wondering how this would affect family programs and Army community services. Well, it depends. I'm willing to cut any program that is not delivering a, a, an adequate return uh, or that I think is of lower priority of something else. I think too often we've tried to spread the money even, Steve, and across multiple things, and we've, leaved, we've left many, and I'm talking now just about uh, the families now, we've left you know, important parts of our Army family unsatisfied. And so what I've tried to do is listen to Sergeant Major, the Vice, our leaders, our families, FRGs, et cetera, and really reallocate dollars to the priorities, to the things that they want. I said up front, child care is very important. So I'm, I want to put dollars there, and I also want to make sure we get the policies right. Because i got to tell you, i got a lot of military kids that are not in on-base child care, and they should be. And so it's things like that that I'm willing to change, either from a funding perspective or from a policy perspective. And the same thing goes for weapons programs or whatnot. Uh, I have to modernize the force. You're, your spouses, your husbands or wives need to be fighting in the best equipment that American offer so that they're not only successful on the battlefield, but they come home safe and secure. And frankly, we, 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 there's a lot better we can do. That's why the budget that will come out in a few weeks will show a large shift of dollars into the future force so we can really give our soldiers top-notch top equipment. That's what they deserve. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Hi, and then we'll take one from online. Great. Hi, my name is Ann Medlin. Um, I am a military spouse. My husband is currently at the G1 at the Pentagon. We finished up our... The G1 G or at the G1? At the G1. <laughs> Guess who's getting this question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we um, finished up our tour in Vicenza, Italy. Great place. Um, about eight months ago, about a year ago now, mm -hmm. and in command. And so I'm going to get real specific, gentlemen. I love what you guys have done with what you've put out today. I think everything that you've addressed is exactly what our military families need. But when I get specific, Vicenza, Italy is the number one duty station in the world that all families want to go to. 
but my wife's nodding her head because we were signed there <laughs> right <laughs> yeah right? but there's a big but so you have housed there 173rd which is a large heavy enlisted you have housed there u.s army africa mm -hmm. which is heavy officer so the problems lie within number one erds in the army number one abuse in the army and also number one divorces in the army we have 173rd kids that come there, and I do say kids, married, two kids already. We don't have adequate housing on that base, so they're stuck 20 to 42 miles away from post in an Italian community. And one car, because they can't afford to have two cars. Yes, we, I'm quite familiar with this. Due yep. to the SOFA agreement, mm -hmm. spouses can't work. So my question to you is, and I'm sorry that I had to get specific, but this was the one opportunity that I felt like I had the opportunity to address it um, because we did what we could when we were there to help alleviate stress, but it was tough. So do you guys have future plans for something happening with that? Or what are your thoughts? In general, being has some. Yep, I'm, and I'm gonna, I'll come to you with more specifics. But the answer to your question simply is yes, ma'am, we are. And uh, yes, conditions. The biggest problem we have in there, as you well know, is we use a lease program um, predominantly, and we have to do significant investment into our housing. That's already begun. Um, as you know, we just recently built a complex for the soldiers over there. So the barracks facilities, I just visited them just a few months ago. Phenomenal, world class facilities. Absolutely. And uh, we do have a very aggressive plan to get our families in similar facilities there. And I'll, I'll defer to uh, General Bingham for the more specifics on that. Yeah, thank you, SMA, and, and thank you for your question. I was just going to say that in our FIDIP, uh, we have housing projects specifically for uh, Vicenza uh, in every year through the FIDIP. And that just kind of goes back to our Secretary and Chief's uh, emphasis on housing for our families and soldiers. So we're uh, very excited about the fact that you may not have it just yet, but it's coming. We've got those projects on the books Correct. and funded. Okay. And secondly, the sponsorship program that you have listed, um, I'm aware that a computer kind of selects the sponsors in some cases now. Is there any possible way that we could go back to old school where you hand select sponsors for these families coming in? So if you have a family coming in that has six children that replaced us, can you have them, instead of getting an enlisted or excuse me i shouldn't say enlisted instead of getting a lieutenant that has no children and never been married being their sponsor can you hand pick those sponsors i mean i know it's going to take a so, little more time but yeah i don't know what the mean i'm going to let the sergeant major explain the means but he and i've had this conversation a few times and i've tackled him in the hallway but i completely agree look so if you're you know a single mom with kids it'd be best if you got a single mom with kids sponsoring you or if you're a single lieutenant or a single <laughs> captain you know you should have a single lieutenant single cap same same sex right if you're a you know a couple with kids i mean it, it should we should marry them up right it should Absolutely. be because yeah. be, be, because they're gonna have the same in, interests and needs right where do i get child care uh where do you go shop um you, you know where's the best place to take your family on a weekend if you want want to take a break right so we're that's my goal. That's the mission I've given him is to make sure. And it has to happen beforehand. So, you know, when Lee, before Lee and I PCS to Italy years ago, I had a sponsor. And uh, they were able to, and, and uh, again, married. We didn't have kids at that time, but married and was able to kind of help guide us, tell us how to find off-base housing, many of the things you're describing. It's just invaluable. Um, and, and particularly for somebody who's, it's their first move in the Army or it's their first move with a, with a spouse or family. Uh, particularly, as you find in many Oconus locations, and this happened to me, is, the, is the, the soldier goes over, the spouse comes later, and often the spouse comes and the soldier's not there. Right. He or she is on a yeah. deployment. So you're, right. she's looking at me because she remembers this. Yeah. And you're left on your own. And that's where having a sponsor spouse to receive your own spouse makes a world of difference in terms of how you're received, not only at that post, but really into the Army. Uh, okay. Because, again, it, it is a family business. So I've... You want to elaborate on the, the process piece of it? Yeah, just real quick, and I know because there's a lot of questions, but uh, so you're exactly right, ma'am. And we just redid the entire regulation. Uh, we had a working group and worked with General Bingham's team here, and we did a couple things. First and foremost, exactly what you asked for. It's written in the regulation that uh, the demographics of the sponsor should match that of the family, but more so we tiered sponsorship. To be very forthright, we're trying to provide everybody with full sponsorship. That's unnecessary, to be very honest with you. You got Mike Sarmate of the Army. 
um, coming here. Um, I probably don't need a sponsorship as much as the brand new private with a family that's been to Vincenza for the very first time. Right. So we tiered it, tiers one, two, and three. And the tier one, most of the sponsorship is focused on that, and that's command-directed sponsorship, where that soldier does not PCS or does not sign into the organization without an assigned sponsor. And then tier two and tier three, and progressively, until you get to beyond that, which is self-sponsorship. You have very senior people that have done this over and over and over again, and they know the people to reach out to. They know the families connect. They know that, hey, Colonel so-and-so lives right down the street. We've been with them. They've been here six months. Let's go link up with those. So I think by tiering it and, uh, and taking the responsibility for the command to try to everybody with a full service when it's not necessarily is going to help us focus the attention where it's needed most. And that's really with our junior soldiers and their young families mm -hmm. who have done it for the first time. Um, so the secretary is getting ready to sign a directive, I think, is from General Bingham. Um, putting this in place. This has been worked through with our senior enlisted advisors for some time. We rewrote the entire thing and we use the Army Career Tractor as a mechanism um, to get direct feedback between the individual being sponsored and the sponsors uh, new at the new location. Outstanding. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. And we're, we're gonna try and hurry up our answers because yep. I, I recognize we don't have, we yeah, have about a few got, minutes only left. Only got a few more minutes, people, but let, so. let, let me get this question because uh, it's We might have to do this every week at AUSA. <laughs> <I don't Yeah. laughs> this, this one's important. This is from Gary Pike, who is a National Guardsman, and we want to uh, recognize our uh, Guard and Reserve uh, families. National Guard and Army Reserve family readiness groups are not located on major military installations. Are FRG volunteers able to fundraise outside armories? Yeah, it's a good question, Gary, and, and, and thanks for your service. Uh, form, I'm a former guardsman and reservist myself, so I, I completely understand it. Um, I want to. We had extensive discussions. This is. I, I want to give FRGs the ability to raise off post, but I forget where we came out on this. Who's? You got the answer? Under special conditions with. With the okay of the of the commander, right? Yes, sir. Under special conditions, with the approval of a senior commander. Right. So we just want to make sure that it's done appropriately off post, uh, and, and there are ways to do that. And you can imagine ways not to do that. But we tried to give a, a venue for if you needed to do that. It was you know it was presented, and a, and a senior commander could do that under the right conditions. I think that answers the question. Good. Right? Good. Is that fair? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Go right ahead. Hi, my name is Vanessa Fury. I am a veteran and a current spouse. Um, and I just had a couple of questions, um, and they're probably both going to end up going towards Transcom. Um, but I wanted to start by saying thank you for um, the efforts that you're making in reducing the hiring time for CDCs. That's going to be immensely helpful for many, many families. Mm -hmm. My children have aged out. However, many of my friends have not. Um, with that, I'm wondering if you were able to lower that hiring time to 60 days because those are NAF positions, um, and because I'm concerned about the QA inspectors having a hiring time of nine months, how we're going to make that happen by summer if it takes nine months to hire a GS but two months to hire a NAF? So good question. I'm, I'm not, I can't commit to getting it down to 60 days in the summer. I'm, I will fight to my last dying breath in this job to get it to 60 days. but. I don't believe I'll get it there in, 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 in by this summer uh, because there's so many other things that need to happen. Um, but you are right. There is a difference in timelines between appropriated and non-appropriated funds. Now, I'm not tracking the, the QA issue, but we're just going to keep pushing hard to, to get it in there because – and what I'm trying to do is, is get it expanded to direct hiring authority. I have a request in right now to uh, DOD OSD policy to get the permission and to, uh, to give us direct hiring authority. If we can do that, I can hire somebody in two to three weeks. Excellent. Okay, but that's where I'm pressing right now. That's the quickest path, but I don't want to mislead you to say that we'll get there this summer. Uh, I want to get there I, before I'm done. I want to get there. So. Before 2021, when this other big <laughs> program rolls out. Um, but the second part of that question is regra regra uh, regarding the, qu the crating. Um, I know that General Clark had made a comment um, last year, I think, Admiral Clark, sorry. Um, Admiral Clark, I think, had made a comment last year about wanting more um, of our household goods crated. However, um, statistics-wise, it is not feasible to do that for crates over 8,000 pounds or something. So if it is on the agenda for this summer as having crating is how we're going to reduce loss and damage, then how does that work for families with 13,000, 15,000, 17,000 pounds? Great question, General yeah, Sullivan. Yeah. General, <laughs> General Sullivan, yes. 
So thanks for the question. So I am not sure of the weight issue. I'm going to turn it over to our, our teammate at Transcom to get to the specifics of that. But the last uh, peak move season, we only created in CONUS about 4% of the moves. Okay, so the goal is to up that to 12%. As, as you may know, that everything that goes overseas is created, and we're trying to get reinstitute that standard, institute that standard at CONUS, particularly for moves that are going into storage, right? If it's going to a warehouse, that prevents pilferage, it prevents breakage, and so that, that is what we're shooting for. The specific of the weight issue, I'm gonna, I'm gonna defer to my uh, teammate at Transcom, Colonel Osborne. Hey, thank you, sir. Um, so the specific on the, on the weight issue, so right now a service member can go in, if they have an 18,000 pound shipment, they can request grading. The problem we run into during the peak season, the reason we did not make that a requirement, is because typically that, that size of a shipment takes two and a half trucks to move. And so when we're having truck driver shortages during the summer, um, during the peak season, that, that doesn't help the capacity issue. So that's one of the reasons we didn't do that. Um, we're also working with industry to, to, to tailor this thing up so we're not, we're not hurting capacity this summer while we're increasing the creating. So there's a couple of different ways we're approaching that, but that, that's why that is. So my concern is, was the follow-up to Megan's question, because it doesn't sound like we're going to be able to hire the up to 50% to help with this summer. So what is it we're doing to help soldiers this summer to get to that 50% with QA or we'll to get to some resolution with crating in the peak season because we know that the last two years have been horrible numbers in terms of loss and damage and we're looking at several of us PCSing coming this summer and worrying about what's going to happen right now in a few months. Right. So, so <laughs> 2021 on the creating, is great but in the yeah. next two years a lot of people move. Yeah so, so the creating piece specifically we're going from we, we typically did 6% during the summer we're increasing that number to 12% and then we'll reassess with across industry. the board doesn't for, matter about for, for shipments going into storage and transit for, for okay. shipments regardless stored of weight no no okay. it's going to be 7,500 pounds and less is what we're looking so at single soldiers probably right. well no there's families with that but if you if you have if you have a higher weight you can request um, you can request a, a created shipment the problem is, like I said, it's the capacity issue, right? So if, if the booking agents at the services don't see the capacity there, they, they, may, they may not be able to fulfill that. Plus you have a, TSPs are busy and a lot of them are right. blacked out certain times of the summer because, yes. they're, because they're busy. So you may get that shipment, but you may have to wait six weeks to get that shipment if you right. really want it that way at that, at that level of weight. So that's some of the concerns we have to weigh in as, as we're working through that. So feasibly, <laughs> it's not going to happen for someone with a 17,000 pound shipment to be able to create that in the summer because they just can't accommodate two and a half trucks to drive that. So that, that happens today um, with some shipments. They, people with those, with those levels of weights do get stuff created. Um, but yeah, it's not gonna be across the board because quite frankly, the, 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 in, the industry system does not support that today. Yeah. Okay, thank you all, yeah. thank you. What we're gonna do, because we're running low on time, is uh, the four uh, folks that are standing there, if you'd come up, ask your question, and once we get all of them, we'll uh, try to get a group answer. So, sir, right. lightning round, lightning round. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for, uh, for being here and to uh, AUSA Family Readers for hosting this event. Uh, my name is Tony Hernandez. I'm a 25-year veteran, United States Air Force Colonel. Uh, currently, I'm the President and CEO of the Defense Credit Union Council. We have a number of on-base defense credit unions located on installations worldwide. My question is, as I look at the list of, 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 of proposals here, specifically the Family Readiness Groups, the, the Total Army Sponsorship Program, and of course, Spousal Hiring. How can defense credit unions assist uh, uh, with implementing a lot of these uh, uh, programs? And uh, who do I need to talk to, because I'm an Air Force veteran, who do I talk to in the Army about partnering up through our public-private partnerships uh, via our operating agreements? So I'll, I'll answer that one right now. Just see General Bingham afterward, okay? <laughs> uh, we've Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your service. Thanks for your offer. Lightning down. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I know a VP position at Vicenza. Uh, yeah, and hire us. Oh. Yeah, hire, okay. Hire, 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 <laughs> hire her. Hire her. Hire her. Who wants a job right now? We're going to get you hired right. right now. Everyone that wants a job, meet with him. He There's will a hire job you at right every now. credit union. There's a job open right now. <laughs> yes, ma'am. We'll hire you in two weeks. How quick can you hire? Two weeks? Very quick. There you go. There, I solved that one problem. Next. Hi, my name is Marianne Campano, and I'm a proud Army wife, and I also work at the Army Public Health Center. Army families are critical to readiness and retention. Current data shows that 
uh, a spouse's satisfaction and support of the military is a significant predictor of whether a soldier is going to stay in. Basically, happy spouse, happy house. I'm wondering, given all the competing priorities, if, you know, with modernization and such, is there a centralized mechanism within our Army that it is a repository for all of the agencies that are working with Army families? I'm currently working with a number of other Army organizations to consolidate data and learn more about what our family needs are. and it seems like it would be a, a, a real win-win, a, a wonderful opportunity to synchronize efforts, reduce duplication, um, if we could make that small investment to, to provide us with all of the organizations that are working with our Army families. Is there such a repository, or can you give me some insight yeah, sure, on sure. other organizations? You want to wait? We, let's wait. Let, let's get that, and then we'll come back real quick. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. Wanna, of course, we're going to run out of time here we, real quick. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. Hi, good afternoon, sir. Uh, Charlie Williams, retired uh, Navy One Star, happily with Armed Services YMCA. And I want to, first of all, thank all three of you for being here today. One of the things that our group sees at 13 branches across the country is, as you've already said, the problem with child care such a challenge in finding affordable, accessible, quality child care, and capacity is so far outreached in so many places across all four services and the Coast Guard. So what I'm wondering is how much of an, how much of an initiative you've seen to take the opportunity to partner with third-party organizations like ours or others to provide those child care services and make them more accessible, either on installation or perhaps even partnering off installation. Great question. Okay, thank Great you. question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Tara Nypaper. I'm a National Guard spouse. And first of all, I'd like to thank Transcom very much for their hard work publishing the TSB scorecards. We really appreciate that transparency. Um, my question is, what recourse does a family have if they're assigned TSB has a terrible score, for example? I believe currently if you reject your assigned TSP, you're not um, guaranteed your move dates anymore. And then my second question, sorry to harp on the QA inspector topic, but um, we really appreciate your commitment to increase the amount of inspectors and um, agree that this is a critical need. Are you going to implement some sort of directive as to how many inspectors are needed per population or per moving population? Because right now um, the QA inspectors are very understaffed. At Fort Leavenworth, for example, there are 2,400 families moving in a four-week period, and Sean is our one inspector, and Sean is excellent, but can't possibly meet the 50% inspection standard. Yes, he will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, he will. You heard so, it. You uh, heard it good. here. <laughs> Let's, uh, this, the first question about the central organization, does somebody want to take that here? or General Bingham, do you want to do that? I have, an answer. I have a partial answer as well. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you so much for that question, and I think it's a great question. I would tell you Military One Source is one location That's that fine. you can go to yeah. to find a lot of that information. And second to that, I would say I'm the Army Staff Principal that uh, does that integration. Uh, so you can see me afterwards if I can kind of lay lock into something specific that you're looking for. So thank you. Yeah, Military One Source is great. I know Leah and I'm sure Sergeant Major's wife has been there to see them. They do a very good job, and we're trying to we're trying to partner, lean on them more so. Uh, the next one was on the the question from the uh, with regard to child care. So I I'll take first stab and let somebody say I, yes. I would be interested in doing that. However, there are requirements that have to be meet and be met to ensure that you know the standards are met with regard to uh, ensuring our kids are safe and all that. But the and then I'm not going to let somebody else jump in because I could point you to the right person. But the third thing I'd say, hold on, Dan. Well, uh, the third thing I'll say is we we're trying to revitalize the on post file. I forget the name, the family child care where where spouses can actually do child care yeah. in their home. It's a program that was very active for a number of years and for some reason is tapered off. It, it is alive and well. We fully support it. And um, I, I'd encourage that, that out there as another outlet. So who, who are you all pointing to? Oh, okay, there you go. Okay. Partnership with third-party organizations, yeah, right? And, and we have partnerships with third-party organizations now, and I'm sure we'd be happy to um, sit down with you and talk about opportunities between our two organizations. 
Great. Okay. Thank you very much. And then the last one was TSP. I guess it's back over here. Yeah. Moves. So thanks for the question. On uh, the uh, customer satisfaction uh, surveys that uh, are now online at the DPS homepage, uh, do now, as the Secretary uh, spoke about, empower our soldiers and families and make informed decisions about the carriers they have. Our families and soldiers do have the ability to select carriers that they want and also disqualify carriers in that module. But ma'am, to your point, there may be a, a situation where uh, move during a particular period may have to be moved a number of weeks to the left or right in order to get the carrier you, you, you specifically want. So that all gets into locally working that with your local transportation provider and trying to get that. So it's, it, again, it, that information in the hands of our soldiers and families is great because it empowers us to make uh, good choices, the best choices for the, for the families, uh, but there may be some uh, wiggle room needed uh, during specific time periods to make sure that you get the carrier that you desire. I hope that answers the question. Great. If, <laughs> I, if I could, I know I made a, a little funny joke towards the end there about Sean. I know he's an aggressive worker out there, but honestly, there's no way he's going to be able to do that many. Um, but I just talked to the secretary, and the good thing about being a star of the Army is you can get approval without going through any of the staff on initiatives. So, um, and he said, and this, so there's similar locations. We have the Star Major Academy, the War College, CGSC, where you have these extreme surge capacities in a very short amount of time. All within about a week, they're PCSing out of there and going somewhere. And we can uh, bridge that by uh, sending our quality assurance inspectors TDY, and we can, we'll do that. So we'll put together a plan to send quality assurance uh, inspectors TDY to those locations during surge periods and make sure we're covered down um, so they're available to ease the transition process during the move. Yeah. And he'll be there. And I'll be there now <laughs> because the secretary just directed it. <laughs> hey, folks, I just, uh, uh, before we turn it back over to uh, General Swan, I just want to thank you all for giving us this chance today to share with you uh, some of the initiatives we're taking to improve uh, family readiness and to take care of our soldiers and, and their spouses and children uh, even better than we have and to follow up on things as well. So. Uh, we were just discussing this has been a great opportunity. We're going to try and do this more often. Yeah. But I want to thank you all for, uh, again, for being here, for your service, uh, whether it's current or in the past as a veteran or a spouse of the veteran. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it, it means a lot to us. It means a lot to, to, uh, to the nation, of course. And um, with that, I'd like to turn over to the vice, see if you want to say anything as well. No, I just, I just want to uh, thank you all. And, and again, there's, there's some things that need to be fixed out there, and we want to get after it. And we really appreciate the feedback. The feedback does matter. A lot of times people don't like to do surveys. They don't like to, you know, take the time. But we actually react to those things. And, and when we do, uh, especially with some of these larger contracts where when we have, you know, uh, uh, folks that are start showing a trend, then we can really go after them because that's how we manage at this level. So thank you for your feedback. Sergeant Major, anything? Ladies and gentlemen, again, uh, just echoing the comments from Chief Secretary, um, your, uh, your interest and your passion for these uh, issues and concerns is very much valued by the, the leadership at this table as well as the Chief Staff of the Army who couldn't be here today. Continue that. Um, send us your concerns. If you're frustrated at the level of chain of command, I ask you to use the entry point first, but I'll by all means go above them if you don't get the answers that you think you deserve and you need to hear for, your, for yourself and your families. So thank you and all of you that are in the room that are, uh, have served um, or, or contribute to service in our great military. Thank you. Before we close, three quick items for you. First of all, we've recorded this today, and it will be on the AUSA YouTube channel uh, this afternoon. Uh, secondly, if you did not get your question uh, asked, especially those 524 now stations uh, that have been tuning in, uh, get your questions in, and they will be answered by the staff and put on the Secretary's spiffy, spiffy website that uh, you saw earlier uh, today, but we, we will get your questions answered. And last but not least, the Secretary mentioned it several times, uh, October at the AUSA annual meeting, one of the most popular portions of that annual meeting downtown are the family forums led by uh, Patty Barron and Thea Green here, uh, and we hope you'll come out for that in October. That's uh, 14 to 16 October uh, this year. Let's give our panel a round of applause.